Roger Homo, thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to talk about 3D printing. How many of you heard of 3D printing? If I was to ask that question five years ago, probably half of you, or if not any of you, would have raised your hands, right? Um, but actually, 3D, you can kind of fly through these because it's way more than 10 minutes long if I don't speed up. Um, but I'm used to yelling because I was a hockey coach as well. So uh, my name's Chuck Kennedy. I have a company called Edge PDM. We're out of uh, we're a product development and manufacturing assistance services company, um, and we specialize in 3D printing. We do CAD, a uh, variety of different things. So the gentleman that was talking about the NDAs, we deal with that or the disclosures all day long. Um, it's a challenge, but it's it's you can get around those things real quickly. You know, NDA, certified mail, back to yourself with your idea, you're protected. So you can do a lot of those type of same things for that protection-wise. But I'm here to talk a little bit about 3D printing. Um, I've been around 3D printing since 1991. And you can kind of go, Roger, and, and like every three minutes, and if I get behind, I'll look up once in a while. Um, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, so 3D printing is, is basically an additive process where traditional manufacturing, traditional tooling, all those things were taking a block of whatever, whether it's steel, whether it's wood, whether it's ABS, whether it's uh, uh, an acrylic, and cutting it down. That's what was around for years, and it's been around for decades, and really since the Industrial Revolution, basically, that they started doing those type of things, forming metals, et cetera. Uh, 3D printing kind of came into the world uh, in about 1984, um, actually. So it is relatively uh, new technology. Uh, a gentleman named Chuck Hall invented a process where they would take a vat of acrylic liquid and hit it with a UV laser, and it would form around whatever someone designed on their computer. Um, at, in those days, it really was for concept modeling. You know, sometimes you'd get a good part, sometimes it would look kind of what you designed, uh, sometimes it would be warped, all these type of things. That was kind of the early days of, of 3D printing. Uh, shortly thereafter, they started coming out. SLA was the name of that technology. Uh, and it was stereolithography is what it was called. And about three or four years later, SLS and FDM, and, and I'll go through those slides that specifically talks about those different technologies, because there really are, you know, now there's offshoots of all those type of technologies, but at the core, they all kind of do the same thing. You know, they're just ballistically or dropping or extruding a piece of media onto a platform and building it layer by layer, thus the additive process uh, technology. Selective laser sintering is a process that was invented out of the University of Texas in basically the late 80s. And we, because I started with that company in 1991, we released our first product in 1993. And it's now become what the terminology is advanced digital manufacturing. That technology has become the one that allows uh, Boeing, uh, General Electric, to do things where they actually don't have to injection mold things. They actually go in and sinter these parts out of nylon and actually use them directly onto an aircraft. So they're building them, putting them on the aircraft. Whereas before, you have to go through the process of uh, cutting a piece of steel to create a mold, injection mold that steel to create a thermoplastic that would be of that shape. Those subtractive processes on those type of parts end up being in the millions of dollars for companies like Boeing for a single mold, for a single component on an aircraft, of which they're building maybe 15 a year, maybe 20 a year. So the return on that investment was a challenge for them. So they've invested very heavily in SLS. Um, FDM is another one, which has really become the revolution of 3D printing, if, if you look at it, called fused deposition modeling. And I'll, like I said, I'll get into that. But that actually does ABS. PLA, other thermoplastics that are used in everyday products as well, but they do it in a different manner. And it's, it's basically um, the gentleman that showed that machine on the recycling, 
picture that as L FDM. It's basically like a toothpaste tube extruding onto a platform and it extrudes it as it goes up. And that's really the technology that has become why everybody here knows about 3D printing for the most part, right? Because that's the one that has come out and become more of a hobbyist um, slash concept modelers that are cheap. So that you're able to get into that technology pretty cheap and be able to produce. But that technology, again, which is great because it's, it's open, you know, the cloud up, if you will, open source information, all those type of things have now, you have, really, it's kind of revolutionized the industry of 3D printing. Mention is everything that you see, for the most part, is modeled, catted, 3D printed at some stages in its development, right? The Furby back in the day, I'm, I'm kind of old, so I look at the Furby when it was first invented. It had a revisit from Hasbro. Um, when Furby did that, first Furby, I remember seeing it eight, ten months before it came out on the market because we had to 3D print it and get it to Hasbro and let them take care of it. Um, Apple iPhones, golf grips, all these things are uh, things that are 3D printed at this stage of the game. You know, and, and what it's used for primarily in, in the concept phase is verification of design. You know, you talk about China, you talk about, you know, the global marketplace now. You've got marketing people in all these different regions of the world that all work for, well, not necessarily Lax, but a Dell. And Dell's coming up with a new tablet, and they've failed 16 other times since 1993 in developing a tablet. So now they're coming out with a new one. They get all these marketing people in the room. They 3D print four or five different look, feel, touch type of models, and they select a couple models that they may go out to the market with. So that's kind of the, the infancy phase of what 3D printing is used for. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's, go back one slide if you will, Roger, because I, okay, go ahead. I might have missed a slide. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Um, you talk about the concept and hobbyist 3D printers. As I mentioned, that picture up there in the upper left corner, that was the first open source product that ever came out. It's called the RepRap. And basically what it was, was it was a, you could build your own 3D printer from open source information that came out online and you could just get the components that sell you the kit, you build it up yourself. That was the first one that kind of started this Revolution, And the reason this started, and I talk about FDM, Infused Deposition Modeling, is patents. These were the first patents to run out, was FDM, Infused Deposition Modeling. Thus, everybody jumped into the game immediately. Okay? So then you, you come out and you've got, and I don't know if you've got this one, Roger, but you've got the MakerBot, which is also one, the Replicator 2, and now they, they got, they're coming out with a variety of different, yeah, they're, they're just blowing it up. The reason they're blowing it up is was they were acquired. Um, this guy, it's a, it's a funny story, but it's a little odd, is the gentleman that invented MakerBot really came off of the open source type of thing, had a rep wrap, and had an idea of taking that and commercializing it and making this MakerBot. So he took all the open source information and created his company, and he just recently sold that company to one of the major players in the market, Stratasys, who I worked for for about four years and sold that company for $400 million, right? And what he did, <laughs> I, I get a little snipey when it comes to this, is everything he did was on open source, right? Well, now Stratasys, the big boy in the market, is now trying to squash that open source technology because they want to protect what they got. So it's, a, it's, a, just, it's an interesting game that gets played with the lawyers of the world and the patent people. But, you know, the bottom line is it, it, it caused a revolution in 3D printing. You've got the 3D Systems, which is another player in the market who I worked for for a few years as well. They, um, they have something called the Cube, and it's basically the same thing. Go ahead. Um, no, I'd have to skip forward a little bit. So go back one. So in a nutshell, when we get to FDM, it's basically the same thing. You've got a filament that is coming through a heated extrusion head, and then it basically heats that material up right below the melting or the right below the true melting point, but hot enough that it will extrude and become a 
semi-viscous liquid type deal, and then it naturally cools and hardens. Okay. Now the downside, there's a few downside of these printers, but the, it's low cost. But what you do have is you got low accuracy, you got low resolution generally. Sometimes you can nail the accuracy, sometimes you can't. As Roger can probably attest at the last meeting when you're talking about these are kind of where I was talking about in 1984 where you might build 10 times and two or three of them come out right. So these hobbyist 3D printers are where, where the SLAs were back in the early days. You know, now the SLAs, you know, granted they're in the four or $500,000 range usually. They're repeatable, et cetera, which is why they've been able to branch into advanced digital manufacturing where they could be ISO certified all the things that are necessary to actually produce parts or manufacturing. Um, again, these concept hobbyist type 3D printers at this point um, create in PLA and ABS, which are you know, two of the top three, if not the top two thermoplastics in the world for making things. Uh, Polyjet printing is kind of a, a, what I would call a design verification tool, as well as a um, um, Proof of concept, limited functionality, certainly fit and form technology. I've got about six of these machines up in Harlingen at my company. And the reason being is I actually, this is an Israeli product. I worked for that company for about eight years before I started out my own. Um, so I know the technology backwards and forwards. So it was an easy transition for me to get into, to get into 3D printing with these guys. So basically what Polyjet is, is it's like an inkjet printer, an old inkjet printer. Okay, it's about the size, my machines range from about the size of a, a desktop type of printer all the way up to like an old Xerox type, pretty big printer. And basically what it does, if you look up there, is it's got print heads. And those print heads get filled with a media of both support and model material. And then it's jetted ballistically down onto the platform. And then it's cured with a UV light. So it just cures it on a layer by layer by layer by layer basis. Um, the upside of this technology is it's very highly accurate and high resolution. It builds at seven ten thousandths inch layer thickness. So it's very, very thin layers and thus you're able to keep accuracies and your resolution is phenomenal. Um, if, you, if you look at a variety, I can kind of pass these around. These are some of the parts that are out there. And I should have started with the, the FDM technology. And you'll kind of see when you look at these differences in these three different parts, that white part is an FDM part. And it wasn't necessarily created by, um, it wasn't necessarily created by a hobbyist printer, but it is kind of shows you the resolution that you're going to get from that printer and the difference of it. Um, so basically the Polyjet, and they actually just introduced a, a, a full color model as well. And that picture in the upper left corner is, is for Trek. And now they're able to, it, it's in a spectrum situation, so you've got semi-limited range of colors, but it's expanded phenomenally. That allows them to print in full color matrix. Uh, it also allows you to, in one of the machines, and I have one of those, is that center picture there is basically a rubber component mixed together with a, a rigid, solid component and it can do a dual material type situation with that that allows you to build um, over molded type of parts and if I were to look at some of these and these are what we call 1911 grips for 45s pretty common thing and what you got is in the center of those parts is a rubber material and on the outside is a solid um, acrylic white material so it kind of revolutionized what this 3D printing can do. It's very heavily used in things like dental, um, for doing uh, uh, fixturing, for doing uh, molds of uh, people's scans. So they'll scan the people's face before they're going to do some periodontal type of surgery. And then they'll come in there and uh, have the fixtures all set up before they go in the final time. So it's really heavily used in uh, medical. We do some, a lot of fixturing as well because of the accuracy and a lot of times in assembly plants, um, which is kind of why I'm down here a little bit because there are a lot of assembly and manufacturing type situations, is 
a lot of times when people are putting things together, they can't touch them. So they may have to put, you know, like today I'm working on a product that um, they're putting in light bulbs and they have to put a heat sink on it, but they can't touch the bulb once they get the heat sink on there. And I don't know all the particulars of it. So what we did was we built a fixture that it just automatically puts it into this um, device that we created out of 3D printing and then nobody has to touch it. It's no hands. So, you know, those type of peripheral devices for manufacturing and assembly um, can be used in this. The downside of this is the materials are an acrylic based material. So they're in, in a solid rigid form. They're really not as strong as a thermoplastic like an ABS or a nylon. Um, but what it does do is it gets you very close. So if you're trying to do an injection mold, before they create the mold and spend the thousands and thousands of dollars, they'll actually build the part and verify everything and then give the go-ahead to the designers of saying, yep, this one's good, let's get this cut out of steel and let's go to our thermoplastic. So it's really, a de this process is for design verification as well as fit form, funct limited functionality type of testing before they go to the next uh, processes. Uh, as I mentioned, selective laser sintering. This is a different process. It basically uses a CO2 laser and powder that is um, particleized to very, very small particle sizes. They do this, as I mentioned, this, this has kind of gotten into the realm of advanced digital manufacturing. Because, and this is probably the technology that's out there. And this is a 3D systems and there's a company out of Germany and there's a few others that are going to be coming out because the patents are running out pretty quickly on uh, this technology. So I think this will be kind of the next, um, not, it won't even be hobbyists. They might be able to get to the level where they're producing some parts that are um, usable. Yeah, on the sintering? Yeah. It does some pretty crazy stuff. I actually worked for them for about eight years, nine years as the field service manager. For EOS? Yeah, they're doing metal. That's the big one. Right, so um, like General Electric is using, actually for their turbine blades, they're sintering metal and using them in power plant turbines. So it's, it's pretty crazy, but if you look at the complexity of some of those turbines, and this is where 3D printing for everything really kind of gets um, exciting for everybody, is you, it's limitless how, what you can build. Whether you can manufacture it after that is another story. But as far as the complexity of geometries, it's limitless. What you can, you know, and I got a term that we kind of use, what you can imagine can be created in 3D printing. Nutshell. Um, so basically what this is, again, is a, it's a powdered material that's rolled across. And say for like nylon that roughly has a melting point of 200 degrees C, it heats that up to 200 degrees C, that powder, right below the melting point, And then a laser hits it and outlines it and solidifies that, just that section. So when you're done, you get a powder cake and you shake off the powder and you got your part. And one of the parts that I'm sending around there, you can kind of feel it. If you feel the part, it's the, uh, it's the um, I don't know which one it is. But no, no, one, of, one of these, the, yeah, the ones you have. If you feel the one that's, that's an FDM. If you feel the other one that's got a little bit of a, abrasiveness to it, that's SLS. So, and it's, a, it's very strong. It's nylon. It's basically um, used in gears. Uh, and that's where the ADM comes in, is they're, they're doing it directly, printing it, and saving a ton of costs on one-off type of printing. Go ahead. <laughs> Again, fused deposition modeling. Again, it's the same as the uh, uh, hobbyist type printers, but this is a production level machine. Um, those SLS machines will run anywhere from, you know, you might be able to get into it for about 300000 all the way up to a million dollars for a metal machine. So they're pretty, pretty expensive. So, you know, you've got a handful of what I'd call service providers, and then it's usually OEM type of companies and pretty big companies that own those type of machines. Uh, fused deposition model, a little bit cheaper. The downside of this technology is really just resolution and speed because it takes a long time for this to build parts. Where the other technologies that I've talked about, um, and again, I, uh, the two other ones, PolyJet and SLS, are reasonably quick technologies. 
uh, FDM technology is pretty slow. But the upside of this production unit is, again, it's being used in ADM as well for actually producing parts that are used on, in a variety of different areas in industry. Um, and basically, again, for fixturing, for turbines, and you're building in an ABS material. They also have nylon as well that they just released. And, but it can build very big parts that are very strong. Um, and again, it's a production level machine. Those, those range anywhere from $200,000 to $600,000 for those machines. And then this is the one the gentleman was talking about that's kind of the big boy. They're, in my opinion, they're the best ones that are doing metal sintering. And it's just that. They, they can do nickel. They can do, um, uh, they're doing aluminum. They're doing titanium. They're doing cobalt chrome. You know, they're really just, it's kind of revolutionizing that business. And what it's done is it's created an offshoot of businesses of entrepreneurs that are actually creating metals for their own specific purpose for, you know, whatever the case may be. Medical's very heavy in this, uh, very, very heavy in medical because, you know, everybody's different, right? So if, if, if I've got a knee, this gentleman has a knee, our knees aren't the same. So if they're having to replace my knee, you know, rather than having to cut it, it's, you know, they, they can't create a mold. It just isn't cost effective. They, they used to, but now they're basically trying to get to the point where the direct metal is centering it. Isn't quite there, but it'll be there. It'll be there soon. Um, and again, they, they actually can do molds um, for injection molding. So to get to that part of creating plastic parts, they'll actually do a mold out of this that might be cheaper as well. Mm-hmm. Right. No, there's some level of porosity to it. There is some level of porosity to it. Yeah. 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 There, there is, but they've gotten now to the point where they use. Sometimes we'll use infiltrants to actually, um, and and we used to in the old days when we tried to do, I, we, um, about the sintering with the DTM. We tried to do it using like brass and actually infiltrate and use a hydrogen furnace to melt them into the brass. These guys are doing it directly, but they've got it down to the point where, you know, it passes all the um, electromagnetic type of testing that you have to do for steel, and it, it's being used in, in real world applications. But there is certainly a, a little bit level of porosity versus a steel that's cut out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's working. You know, GE's got about six of these machines up in Cincinnati. Um, you know, the, the, you look at some of these shiny parts, it's still not quite art yet, or I'm science yet, it's, it's still a little bit of art. So even though when it comes out, it comes out like this middle one. Then a machinist has to come in and grind it, polish it, and really get it to where it can be used as a mold. And that's cost as well. But the cost, you know, there, so there's still a challenge there. That's why traditional manufacturing isn't going anywhere because um, their technologies like uh, multi-axis mills, five-axis mills, they've revolutionized their own industry themselves to compete at that level as well. So any of you that are studying to be machinists and running multi-machines and that type of stuff, it's not going anywhere. I guarantee you it's not going anywhere. Go ahead. Um, it's all about design. I, I'll, I'll wrap it up real quick. In order to do any of those things, you have to have a good file to be able to create. And so it all comes down to 3D design. So when I always kind of talk about, you know, people have talked about, you know, people are going to have these printers in their house. They're going to be printing forks and knives and something breaks in their house. They're going to print it out. They're not going to do that until someone creates designs for every one of those. And most of the people that are doing that are going to protect their design as long as possible because they're pumping these out. So, you know, there's, there's kind of this vortex that's going to be sitting there and nobody's going to be able to penetrate for a while. But I think it'll get there. It'll kind of be like the Jetsons. Remember the Jetsons? Well, Isn't that what you're looking at? The, uh, the yeah, yeah. Right, right. I actually got one of those. It's a pretty neat device at, uh, for scanning. But, uh, 
Yeah, and, and MakerBot's got one as well, a Digitizer. Problem is, is the volumes, the insides, internal surface. It's really good on the outside surfaces, but how you get to that, those end up, you know, the cheap versions, you can do it, but those are $20,000 machines, you know, because they've been around for a while as well. But the, the, again, I'll call it the hobbyist, for lack of a better word, those type of scanners um, just can't get there yet. I've got one that's it's kind of a neat toy, but that's all it is. Like I can scan a face and print a face, and it, it really looks good, but it's not uh, commercially viable. Um, to end it, uh, as I mentioned, we're a product development manufacturing company where we, we help people from sketch all the way to get them involved in injection molding if they got a product. So um, that's what we do. We're, um, we use um, all the different processes. We use, and I, I, there's a bunch of them I didn't talk about, but they're all kind of the same concept of those three that I did talk about, which is SLS, FDM, and PolyJet as well. Um, any questions? Well, there's, there's, you know, if you're, if you're in art and you're doing things like that, it's Rhino's a big one for doing uh, a very creative type of parts. Industrial, you got SolidWorks, ProEngineer, and Katia is, is pretty big. And I'm not a huge, uh, Jose's my CAD guy, so he may know all the other, you know, and then, you know, architectural, they use Revit. Revit's a big one for creating architectural models. Um, so it's, you know, the, the dominant ones, I would say still are probably, I would throw it out there and say Rhino and SolidWorks are the two dominant ones. But automotive uses a lot of Katia, right? So. Yeah. At Sandia? At Sandia uh, National? Or? Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I can, I absolutely, I haven't heard of that particular one, but I could see it. Um, because the, the other revolutionary things that are going on is they're using these printers now for actually printing tissue. So, you know, um, for pharmaceutical companies mostly now is they'll take a tissue of liver and actually synthesize it and then print out a liver and then use it for testing their injections on, on different meds. So, you know, it's limited. They're even doing chocolate. Hershey's contracted with that one cube 3D system to actually 3D print chocolate, you know. So, yeah, it's crazy what they're doing. Patents is a good one, right? Um, and, you know, if you talk about the, the technologies of the FDM and the SLS, um, FDM is pretty open now. So that's why you've seen this bump. But to get to the reality of being able to do things in, in usable plastics, SLS and SLA, their patents have to come up. And, and they are, but they're probably not going to be up until around 2017 because I, I, the date escapes me, but I believe it was... In 2007, they changed the laws on patents. And so these companies went in and they just blasted the offices because they knew if they didn't, they were going to be unprotected in, in, I think, in 2012. So they gave them 10 years. So they just kind of stacked their patents. So there was a, an article on SLS. They talked about the patents coming up on uh, SLS just last week. The problem is some of the core patents for producing good parts are still protected. So people are going to come out with these machines, but they're, not, they're either going to infringe on the patents and get sued. And trust me, be, trust me, all of these companies are willing to sue. And they don't waste any time at all. They got lawyers on staff, and they're lawsuiting all the time to protect this. Correct. That's where the money is. Right. Yep, yep, exactly. And on top of patents, material price. The materials are still pretty expensive for producing, you know, if, if you look at it from an from a in-everybody's-house 
you know, I'd say patents, materials, and design. Those three. Well, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because as I, as I mentioned in, in one of my statements was that when MakerBot got purchased for $400 million by Stratasys, Stratasys immediately wanted to come in and stop all the innovation because they got $400 million and that's a lot of $2,000 machines, right, to get back that $400 million. So they're coming in now and just trying to, you know, so these, these companies that have been around, and I've been around all of them, so, you know, and I've been part of lawsuits and had to be involved in, you know, engineering discovery and all of this type of stuff, is they're very, very protective of their patents. And the reason is, is they make their money off of materials. The consumables are where they make their money. Right. Yep. 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 And Cubital was the first company that did that, and they went away. They were, they actually, it was this big monster machine that it it printed, cut, all in the same deal, but it could produce some really neat stuff. But yeah, they, you know, they're all going to protect that type of information. So. Any other questions? Sorry, I went over my ten minutes, Roger. But thank you all very much. Oh, yes.